Welcome to this episode of Eureka. We are going to have a very wonderful conversation with Professor Rodam Narsimhaiya. He was the uh, former director of National Aerospace Limited in Bengaluru. Before we continue this conversation, let's take a quick look at his brief profile and this conversation will continue. Keep watching. Professor Rodam Narsimha is an Indian aerospace scientist and fluid dynamist. He was formerly a professor of aerospace engineering at the Indian Institute of Science and director of National Aerospace Laboratories at Bengaluru. Professor Rodam is presently an honorary professor at JNCASR Bengaluru and currently holds the Pratt and Whitney Chair in Science and Engineering at the University of Hyderabad. Professor Rodam also worked with Professor Satish Dhawan during his time at the Indian Institute of Science. His scientific research works are mainly concerned with transition and turbulence in shear flows, atmospheric fluid dynamics and clouds, and high speed flows, and has also been closely associated with aerospace technology development in India at both technical and policy making levels. Recently, he designed a novel wings of turboprop aircraft which can reduce fuel burning up to 10% and is also useful in short haul flight routes and can connect small cities. Professor Rodam received many prestigious awards and noted among them is the India's second highest civilian award, Padma Vibhushan. It was in the year 2013. Uh, thanks for being with us. It's a very excellent opportunity. I've read some of your papers, some of your work. There are some common interests and there are lots of queries. That's what I'm going to ask you and then uh, understand. Uh -huh. uh, let me start with an uh, 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 interesting episode in your life, which is uh, when you went into uh, Indian Institute of Science. That's when Professor Dhawan has just joined, right? Yes. And that time itself, you both started doing some research when IIC was not known for uh, doing uh, deep research in those days, right? Yeah. So, so what was the kind of research you got into? Yeah. Right? Like, well, what I found was that um, when Dhawan came there, he actually had a PhD from Caltech, mm -hmm. and he was already known for some work that he had done there. Um, so he came, uh, he came to the Indian Institute of Science, and started doing high-speed aerodynamics, supersonic force, uh -huh, uh -huh. not known at the institute at that time. It was a mysterious subject to all of us. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he was one of those people who said, okay, I will teach you a course on gas dynamics. And uh, it was, um, well, I, I learned a great deal from him, I must say. Mm -hmm. um, his attitude, his abilities and so on. So the first thing he did was, he, you know, you talk about shockwaves, for example. Okay. Mm. Shockwaves were all a big mystery at that time. But he said the best thing to do is to show it to them. So he built a small supersonic wind tunnel. Wind tunnel? Supersonic wind tunnel. Half a centimeter side. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. okay. So it's just that kind of thing. And it got a high pressure air he needed. There was no compressor at the time. But it was still not so long after the war. He took those old oxygen things from World War II aircraft pumped them at high pressure, put them there, set up a, an optical system with the razor blades and so on, you would all see shockwave. He's that kind of man. Well, uh, he immediately became the man I looked up to. And he said, uh, well, you do some research with me. This was, I, st I still work, working for my diploma. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I would love to do that, I said. So I, did, I helped him on that tunnel and on a bigger tunnel. And at the end of two years, I had to decide what I wanted to do. I think um, I really wanted to do research, but I was not quite sure yet, because research was still uh, relatively new to me, whether I was going to be able to uh, you know, do well in that thing or not. But uh, Dhawan seemed to have no doubt. So he said, um, well, what are you going to do afterwards? And I said, well, I, I might... Um, because one thing I had in mind also is the atmosphere. I joined the industry uh -huh. and I'll go to the med department, I said. 
So he said, no, why don't you stay here and do some research? Mm -hmm. I think we will have a fun time. I said, well, okay, if you're taking me, I'll stay here. So that's how I did it. And it was so typical of him that he was trying to solve a problem. Wow. With another wind tunnel, we had a bigger one, seven feet by five feet. But you know, most flows mm. have two states in which they can be found. That lamina, let's just say smooth, nothing uh, random and so on, uh, clean edges. So, so you can also observe it in home, no? If you light a agarbati. Exactly. For some more time, the smoke is like a straight Exactly line, right. And suddenly it becomes a... Absolutely correct. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So, it is, it is going undergoing a transition from lamina to turbulent. Uh -huh. And that was at that time a big problem, not yet solved. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, where the transition occurs was still something which was not very clear. And in that uh, tunnel, it so happened that it seemed to be in the transitional range. Okay. Which meant that if we, suggest, if we uh, tested a wind tunnel model, aircraft, well, it would not be in the conditions in, the, in which it would be in the flight. In the, in flight. Uh -huh. So that was the motivation. But after we started, it became a fundamental problem. And uh, there was not much money at that time. So we all had to scrounge around for things and make it at home or in the workshop. So eventually I made a setup in a small tunnel for studying what happened during the transition. Meanwhile, I got a report from the United States. Well, Dhawan got a report from the United States and put it on my table and take a look, he said. It was about transition. Mm. Uh, there had been one theory about transition a little bit earlier, some five years earlier. He said it occurs in spots. It's not suddenly turbulent. Small spots, big spots and so on. So that uh, report proved in a very convincing way that that picture was right. Okay. But the mathematics that the man, man had done, he did not compare it with. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was surprised. Now he's, he's saying that his theory is right, but it doesn't actually do, it, do a quantitative comparison. Uh -huh. And uh, so I took that theory, plotted it and found, in fact, it didn't agree. Okay. Uh -huh. At first I was surprised, but I con 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 made sure that it was uh, not to be remembered. And I said, good God, this is an American report. How come they didn't even say a word? <laughs> so anyway, it bothered me for a few months. And eventually I found out what a solution might be. Those spots are all breaking at one line, one point. Not all over the surface, as that man said. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It doesn't happen all over the surface. It does it only at one okay, surface. A... So I made a theory for it, partly his, but partly with a different thing. And it worked. It worked, it agreed with his. By then, I had also made some measurements. I built an amplifier and so on. Our measurements agreed too. So we knew that uh, this was the answer. And Ravan said, as I had done it, he refused to put his name to it. Okay. He said, you go ahead and publish a note, which was accepted by the American Journal. So he was now convinced that it was correct. And we spent uh, the rest of my time trying to show how this model will now explain what happens during transition. Okay. okay. And it did. So, so that's how uh, wind tunnels, various things it has. Correct. Okay. That's right. Another interesting thing uh, that I also came to know is your interest in Veena. That's correct. So how do you to in a research about strings? Yes. <laughs> Which uh, perhaps uh, people would have thought that it's solved in uh, classical uh, physics, right? <laughs> Strings, nothing yes. new, nothing. I mean, it's a harmonic vibration, you know. Yes, I mean, yes. Yeah, so, what was actually the problem that you found when you saw Veena playing? Well, okay, I, I like music and Carnatic music and, and uh, the Veena as an instrument. So, I had a teacher. I took, uh, well, he taught me for four years. After four years, I went to the institute and I found it was not easy to, for me to mix two things. But the thing that um, um, puzzled me is that if I twang that wire on the Veena, it always uh, didn't move in a plane. It always moved in some kind of an ellipse or a circle. Uh -huh. Why is it doing that? Why it should? But from the string theory I had read, when there's a string and you put a force on it, it will vibrate in that plane. Same plane. Same plane. Yeah. But it doesn't do it. Like a pendulum is moving in the same Correct. plane. Yeah. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. It is not doing it. Nobody had, uh, I, I looked at all the papers, it had not, no explanation had been there. Fortunately, I had a man, I had a colleague, a senior colleague, on the same campus at the institute, 
who was also interested in string vibrations. And he said, come and take a look at what I am doing. So I went there and his wire was also doing the same thing. And then they also had a theory, not for that, but for the amplitude of the vibrations. Then I got interested. We used to go have lunch together once a month, a talk shop. And then I looked at his equation and uh, then there were other equations. And I found out that there had been at least half a dozen equations ah. in the literature. For the same phenomenon? For the same, for the same uh, string vibration. Okay. Yeah. I said, this is amazing. It, they don't seem to agree on what it is. It's a string, I think, is a very simple system. Then I realized that there was something, some, some fundamentally uh, different thing that was happening for which they did not have the mathematics. Mm. Fortunately, Caltech was well known for uh, having made that mathematics and I had done pro some problems there already and some other things. It seemed to me that's what I should do. So I got that method, looked at it and went through the whole thing and came up with a new equation. Okay. Which was, uh, which was immediately accepted for publication also in Britain this time. And um, uh, it attracted the attention of a small number of people only uh -huh. at that time. <laughs> uh, one of them was a well-known former professor at Caltech. He took objection to the name I had given to some term there. He said, no, no, that's not the name. It should really be named after so-and-so. So I said, thank you very much. But he didn't make any other comment. He was known as a very critical uh, scientist. So the fact that he did not criticize me meant that I must be right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a French mathematician, by internationally known, Leon, who actually wrote a paper on how the equation had done, he could prove existence and uniqueness of the solutions of the equation. I said, if those people are taking my equation seriously, this must be right. But you know, it actually came only very slowly. People somehow had their favorite equations and they didn't want to move to this new one. Now, believe it or not, it has taken 50 years, 50, 60 years after I wrote that, 50 years after I wrote that paper, for everybody to begin to see that this was the correct equation and the others were actually not, they are all something wrong. Okay. <laughs> that, that's, that's a very, very interesting uh, right. thing. And uh, this is where we will take so a very we short call break. It after me. And, uh, <laughs> That's, that's a very interesting thing. This is where we'll take a very short break. Uh, keep watching Eureka. After the break, he is going to show us a very crazy aeroplane wing. Keep watching Eureka. It's going to be very interesting. We'll take a very short break. Which article defines qualification for the membership of Rajya Sabha? Article 84 of the Constitution lays down the qualifications for the membership of the Rajya Sabha. Welcome back to Eureka. We are having a very wonderful conversation with Professor Rodam Narsimha, who was a former director of National Aerospace Laboratory in Bangalore. Sir, you designed a very crazy, I mean to look uh, exactly, uh, aircraft wing which you are uh, holding in your hand. Can you tell us what that uh, thing is? How does it look like? Can you show it to us? Yes. Um, let me show it this way to viewers. And um, the major thing here is that this is a turboprop aircraft. It has two propellers and they are being uh, uh, done by uh, turbines, gas turbines. It is not a jet aircraft. Yeah, yeah. Now, I must say that I have uh, for quite some time, it's probably now 10 years at least, been arguing with the government, with my colleagues and with everybody, that what India needs to make is a turboprop and not, uh, you know, uh, well, we're making some defense aircraft. Um, because India is a country where the towns are close to each other. Whenever somebody flies in a jet aircraft, not a propeller aircraft, he's burning unnecessary fuel. In short distances, uh -huh. unless you are going from Bangalore to Delhi or Ahmedabad or something, and I'm going from from Bangalore to Madras, to go on a jet is to burn too much fuel. Bangalore to Hyderabad, Bangalore to Kerala. How come we are not doing it? Our country has the largest, you know, is the third largest in civil, tra civil traffic now. Okay. The small towns are not connected. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I said we should connect the small towns, otherwise they are isolated. Northeast, Jammu and Kashmir. 
Incidentally, I have visited both places and talked to people. And I always felt that, uh, you know, they were, they were a little isolated from the country. One man in Assam went to the extent of saying, Sir, how come a scientist like you from India comes to Assam? <laughs> I said, what do you mean from India coming to Assam? Are you not part of India? He said, no, no, but nobody comes here. You see. So I wanted to make aircraft which are economical for us. And um, that's what led to see how these uh, wings were designed. <clears throat> well, I'd learned that earlier. I also spent time at HAL, working on the LCA, actually. Yeah. And that was another part of my career. Um, so, uh, after the LCA, it started on and gone off. I turned to this. Now, it, somehow it struck me that the way that they were designing wings for a turboprop aircraft, where there are propellers in the front, was not right. Okay. Why? Because the wind moves at a greater speed behind the propeller. Yeah. So if it's going at uh, 200 miles per hour, uh, the wings, relative to the wings, they see 200 miles per hour coming in. Yeah. But behind the propellers, it's not 200, 200 miles. Hmm. It's it's different. Different. Uh -huh. it's, it's more. The, this thing is actually conveying more kinetic energy, which we are wasting. Yeah, yeah. So I said I'll design an aircraft, which will not see only one velocity, but will see a distribution of velocity here. Okay. Uh -huh. Well, I made a theory for it. And I found out, when I actually worked it out on the computer, that it suggested that the car behind the propeller should be shorter. Okay. And the longer thing should be on the side, on its sides, on either side. And it uh, told you that it actually saved drag. And it was not a small, small amount, you know, 10%, 8%, that sort of thing. But then, of course, that was a new design. And uh, I was not satisfied that my theory said that. So I took it to the wind tunnel at the institute, made a model, measured it, and we found that in fact its drag had decreased. In fact, it had decreased more than what I had predicted. Okay. So that was, uh, well, so I then I had to find out why it had actually <laughs> a greater reduction of drag. That's another question. But anyway, after that, <clears throat> we published it, and I've taken patents over it in the United States and Europe, and of course in India. Because I think that uh, this will save fuel burning by at least 10 percent. That will be substantial. That is, that's substantial. And especially in India, you know, in India, you'll be surprised. The most common distance between two airports where all these things go is 500 kilometers. Less than 800 kilometers, 70 percent of our aviation is less than 800 kilometers long. Okay. Uh. And we fly these jets. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, of course, this will be somewhat slower, but that's not a large, uh, large amount. So I've argued this with, uh, of course, my own colleagues at NAL. <laughs> they, of course, all bought it. And with uh, HAL, they were not so, so keen. They, they didn't think that somebody could make a wing here which is different from what's been there and so on. And then talk so to... So that's an ongoing process. That's right. So at the end, I even made a presentation to the planning commission. And so slowly, opinion has begun to change. Now there's an aircraft. Uh, now NAL is trying to make an aircraft turboprop. Okay. And I'm hoping that they will use this configuration. And one of these days, we will see aircraft like this in the sky. Very nice. Sir, this is where I want to ask you a slightly a different question. I mean, you have been uh, in research and uh, industrial development, technology development, product development like this for quite a long time. One of the questions that uh, many people have in their mind is a country like India, where there are health problems, there is a problem in agriculture. Should we uh, spend our time researching on things like, like, say, for example, aircraft? Is it not the, is it our first priority? Is it a priority? That kind of question. So, how do you look at, I mean, wh what do you think should be the kind of research ecosystem in India? Well, I certainly agree that um you know, problems like food production, agriculture, health and so on, are very important for India. You might even say they're more important than this. There's no doubt about it. But in those fields, <clears throat> um, what we should do in terms of treatment, in terms of medicines, is by and large well known. And it's a question, I think, of the way we organize and the money we spend, rather than 
Of course, there are some diseases which are, uh, which are particular to India. Those we have to tackle ourselves. But in many other cases, it's by and large known. And agriculture has, I think, extraordinary potential. So I do think that they're very important problems. And of course, it must be done. There's no question about it. It so happened, however, that that's not the way my mind has gone. <laughs> <laughs> no, and the reason I say that is that um, <clears throat> there's also this other thing. We are still not sufficiently industrialized to this day. 70 odd years after independence, of course, we have more industry than before. There's no doubt about it. And we are doing well in one or two areas. But still, we are not a big industrial force in the world, not even in India. We still import many things. We import all our aircraft. So it doesn't make any sense. And uh, when we get aircraft, we don't get the ones which are most suited to this country. So I would say that while they are very important, and perhaps even more important than the sort of thing that I am doing, it is something which one has to do. I did do one thing in between. Uh, you know Mr. Divya Gundapa? Yeah. Okay. For four years, I was his Sishya. Uh, I used to attend the Sunday classes he conducted. And um, they were actually very interesting. Uh, I don't know if you knew Mr. Gundapa. He, has, uh, he was the, uh, you know, he had not passed uh, SSLC. But uh, his English, his Kannada, his Sanskrit were all very good. So every morning we used to do two texts. One in English, uh, usually political. One in Sanskrit or uh, Kannada, philosophical or uh, literary. But you also had to do another thing. This is the social work. We had to go around the areas, find out whether well maintained, whether the municipality was doing its job, or was this area neglected, and we made reports. And we made reports and we submitted them to the government. Uh, Mr. Gundapa was also a journalist in his earlier years, and he knew all those people, and he was a great admirer of Vishweshwaraya. And uh, so, I did do some social work. But uh, <laughs> once again, after four years, as I told you, I came to the institute, and I must admit that I have not really done anything of that kind again. Uh, although this has taken my whole time, so to speak. Yeah. Very well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's a nice thing. Uh, this is where we'll take another short break. Okay. Uh, keep watching Eureka. We'll continue this wonderful conversation after a short break. How Rajya Sabha makes law on state subject. Rajya Sabha empowers the parliament to make law on the state subject by passing a resolution by a majority of not less than two-thirds of members present and voting. Welcome back to Eureka. We are having a very enlightening conversation with Professor Rodam Narsima. He was a former director of National Aerospace Laboratories in Bangalore. Sir, we have been talking about your uh, past work in uh, fluid dynamics and also your interest in uh, developing technologies uh, of aircraft. Another area that you are also known in India and abroad is your interest in science in ancient India. So, generally uh, when people talk about science in ancient India, there is either uh, uh, very uh, what one can call as a very romantic picture of, you know, mm. everything was known or a kind of a very dismissive picture of uh, nothing existed. So, what, what, how do you uh, look at this uh, area, science in ancient India? What's your take on it? Yes, when uh, you see, <clears throat> after I did my degree here and research, I went to the United States. And I went to the same place where my Guru Dhawan had been, Caltech. And uh, they all welcomed me because the, uh, Dhawan was held in great uh, respect there. Respect meaning very loving respect. He was a favorite with everybody. Um, so, I um, but the, the number of Indians at that time was very small. I mean, I'm not talking about the 1950s. And there were only three people. And one of them was on the faculty, two students and so on. For this, I can't take as a whole. But I began to see slowly that Indians did not seem less smart than the Americans. Mm. Okay, at mm. least at, yeah. at least the grades they were getting and so on. And I could understand a fair bit of it without any problem. And I even took a course in physics because it was necessary for me. I took physics as my minor. 
And I remember they first asked me, uh, do you know the theory of relativity? And I said, yeah, I've heard of it and I know something. Do you know Maxwell's equations? Yeah, I've seen that, but I've not studied Maxwell. Then they said, well, you know, I'm not quite sure whether you will do well here or not. Fifteen days. You come there and decide afterwards whether you want to continue. And I went there for 15 days and decided to continue. So I learned many things, which I would not have normally learned, from the physicists and also from the mathematicians. Mm -hmm. And I used that method of mathematics in some of the work which I did for my thesis. So um, that method at that time was still very new. Mm -hmm. It had not yet spread. Well, so I came back, but I knew that method. And I saw that uh, my colleagues there at Bangalore, here at Bangalore, in the institute, but doing problems is really called for that method. Okay. But they didn't know uh -huh. that there was a method that you could do it. So I helped a few students, gave some lectures, and all of that went ahead. Uh, that was the method that I used uh, for solving this thing. Right, for solving that yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that's what made me think: Why is it that uh, science in India is not known outside? Mm. There's nothing about Indian science which came there. And I tried to find a book in the library. I found anything about Indian science. The only thing I, I, I got was Alberuni's <laughs> <laughs> book on India, yeah. which I read incidentally. It was interesting. Well, and then I came back after my thesis. And it was always bugging me in my head about what had happened in India. Because we had not been taught anything. Yeah. So I started reading. And what I started reading long ago, slowly built up. And I began to form certain views about uh, the history of science in India, uh, which I think were largely my own. There are other people who have written about the history of science in India. I found that there were other books actually. Mm -hmm. and the conclusion I came to was this. I heard two views very often. One said, India has no use, it has no history. In fact, one famous scientist whose name I will not uh, uh, bring out here, he said, India is not a scientific civilization. I was in that meeting. I was aghast. <laughs> <laughs> but then there are other people, you know, who say, everything in India is known. Everything in the world is known to Indians. Our ancient rishis already knew about quantum mechanics and relativity and so on. They knew the speed of light. They reproduced exactly the same answer. They built aircraft, and I wish I knew were wrong, because those aircraft didn't have the thrust in the right direction. Yeah. And it's not true. So there are these two limits. One which says the Indians are useless in science, and the other one says we knew everything. Then I started reading the originals myself in Sanskrit. Thanks to Mr. D. V. Gundapa's lessons and so on, I could make some sense and I still needed a commentary. And then I, I found, to my great surprise, that the great Indian mathematicians, whether you take uh, Ajabata, Nilakantha in Kerala, or many other people, they were irrational. Charaka, they were very rational. They were not, they were not superstitious at all. Um, Aryabhata says, after he did all of this, his astronomy, at the end, he says, this is what I have dredged out of a notion of truth and falsehood. All those gems, <laughs> which really so are mati, true. No? Huh? By one my effort. my own ah. mind. Which, however, is the gift of Brahma to me. That's what he said. But it was human. Nilakanta said almost the same thing. He said, it is not scriptures. It is my intelligence which is giving you this result. And Charaka said, had strict conditions. He said, this medicine is not divine, religious or any such thing. It is yukti. It is actual. There, is, there are diseases. There are uh, um, cures for them. And you can actually make them. There are... Uh, symptoms and then you can find out the disease and you can make cures. So where did this idea come from that Indians were not rational? I, I think that that's a totally mistaken view. It is not that there are not people who say that, that they've been there. Yeah. But the real great scientists never made that uh, mistake. So I began to see Indian science in a very different uh, side. I then, uh, f basically, my position now, after doing this for or oh, 50, 60 years now, <laughs> is that um, India is rational in a different way from the Western way. A very nice uh, 
I mean, uh, debate, I mean, uh, conversation that we had about uh, science in ancient India, how we need to understand that it's not in the extremes, but in the nuances, the uh, real sense and real uh, appreciation lies. That was a very nice and very enlightening uh, information from you, Thank sir. You. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. It's been a very wonderful conversation. Keep watching Eureka. We'll come back with another interesting conversation next week, same time.